And we're back like we never left. Oregon fans, what's going on? How we living? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast. Happy to have you along on another big episode of the podcast. Football is in the air in Eugene, and joining me to break down some duck football is my guy, Spencer McLaughlin, longtime friend of the show. How we doing, man? Good to see you. Ready for football. Anything and everything. Lanning spoke for six minutes and 45 seconds. He said nothing. I was glued to every word. Hey, I think it was actually one of his better press conferences in terms of just giving us a little something to write about, but um we'll we'll talk about that uh i'm sure in a little bit a little bit later but in today's episode man we want to talk about our biggest questions for oregon football here in the spring the ducks held their first practice on thursday today is friday and they'll be back at it on saturday before taking a two-week break for finals and spring break so i i know what my question is spencer but i already kind of wrote about a little bit so i want to toss it to you for the first question that you have for the Ducks here in spring ball. Who is going to play along the defensive line? Like who, who are those guys going to be there? There are going to be not one guy, but multiple guys that play a key role on the Ducks defense this year. I think the number could be as high as four, but it's going to be at least two, at least two redshirt freshmen, defensive linemen or true freshmen, that play up front for the Ducks this year when when the game is still in doubt or on the line. So I don't know who those guys are going to be. You know, Amari Washington had the most snaps amongst the redshirt freshmen from last year, but I, I don't know how much that necessarily means going into spring football this year. It's perhaps a starting point, but, you know, would it surprise me if Johnny Bowens or Terrence Green suddenly sprouted up and was a starter alongside Jamari Caldwell? No, it re- it really wouldn't because you got Keon Ware Hudson in there, and I think we-, we know what Keon is at this point in his career. He's been around for a long time, and like he- he's a solid rotation caliber player, but he's not a high end starter. And I think that those guys were all recruited to Oregon to be high end starters, and you know that's something that Lanning did say in his presser of you know he wants those guys to develop a plan to play, not a plan to sit, a- and that that's kind of how they have to approach this mentally is they, they've got to go into spring football thinking okay I, I I have to show the coaching staff right here right now that I'm good enough to play that I've arrived and I'm ready and I've been in the weight room and been eating right and learning the playbook and everything of the sort so you know Caldwell's locked in up front on the interior but I don't think anybody else is and, and you're gonna have probably as many as six interior defensive linemen you think that, that, that are going to play this year? I mean, you, you had the four from last year, right, of Dorless, Taimani, Rogers, and Popo. And then Ben Roberts and Keon Ware Hudson were also, you know, lightly used rotation guys. So if you figure you need six interior defensive linemen, they got to come from somewhere. And, and I think you start with that class. So that's the biggest question that I've got going into spring football. Jamari Caldwell definitely seems like he's – pretty solidly written in there on the depth yeah. chart at, at this point. I mean, you usually write at this point in spring, kind of write things in pencil, but with his experience, his production, all conference guy from a season ago, I think you can solidly put him in there. Uh, Landing spoke about him on Thursday saying that he brings explosive power and speed, and he's a dominant guy that can get into the backfield kind of more often than not. So that's really what you want in your defensive lineman a guy who can help stop the run. That's obviously super important, going to be perhaps more important for Oregon in the Big Ten, but also someone who can be disruptive and give you some pass rush because that's where Oregon, I think, is really kind of trending up right now. Um, But it's going to be on this team to continue trending up given some of these losses that they have. You get guys back like Jordan Birch, Mateo Uyunglele, and the like. But behind Caldwell, it it does get pretty interesting, Spencer, like you mentioned, because – Keon Ware Hudson's played a lot of ball for the Ducks, and, and I'm excited to kind of see some of this youth movement. I want to see more of Amari Washington uh, out of Arizona. Um, I want to see more of Ben Roberts, who signed with Oregon in 2022 out of Utah. So a guy who's a little bit more seasoned, but still hasn't seen a ton of snaps. But also Michael Gardner, he's a name. Maybe you even have some true freshmen, Jericho Johnson, Aiden Breeland, Zadavian Sims. But the more I think about it, I'm kind of glad that Oregon hasn't really added, I mean, aside from Caldwell, they haven't added any defensive linemen out of the transfer portal 
And maybe that would give you a little bit more confidence if they had some more experience along that spot. But I think that the staff has really recruited the D line to kind of lean into this position. Like when they, they recruited who they got in 2023 and 2024, knowing full well that this was the position they were going to find themselves in as we stand here in spring ball. Yeah, I completely agree. And you know, I I'm, Definitely, as many Oregon fans out there know, more of a traditionalist fan. And look, I, I think the portal's great, and Oregon uses it very well, and they should. And I, I'm fully on board with that. But I, I'm not someone who wants to see Oregon go completely into the portal to find their best players. I think you want to have a mix. Yeah, you can bring in guys from the transfer portal who have developed elsewhere. But the the old school method of recruiting and developing guys it, it's still applicable. It's still important in college football. It's just lessened. It's it's not the only legitimate way to build a roster, but it is still how you want to have the foundation of, of your team be built. Because I think you look at these teams that are, are so heavily portal driven with how they develop their rosters and put together, you know, a lineup of 85 scholarships. I don't think there's a team that has done phenomenally well on that front. When you look at the highest rated transfer portal classes in, in college football the last couple of years, there you're, you're talking about, what, 10 to 12 players, you, you, usually, that, that are actually going to step on the field and make an impact? I mean, you look at Oregon's transfer class last year, it was top 10, and you know, it included Junior Angulao, Nishad Strother, and Connor Soley, and well, those guys didn't play. You go the previous year, Caleb Chapman never played. You had uh, guys that, you know, came in and maybe played a little bit less than and some people were expecting or didn't play at all, you know. So I, I think that for, for Oregon, you're, you're 100% right that that 2023 class, the recruiting class, w- was, w- was brought in for this year. The, the, this is why they went out and got 10 linemen nine of whom are still on the roster which is maybe the most impressive part like you bring in 10 defensive linemen and four or or sorry um all but one are blue chip guys and and the only guy that's transferred out of the room was the non-blue chip recruit and not that Tavita Palme can't go to Oregon State and be a good player or anything of that sort but I think that he transferred out because he looked at the writing on the wall. Maybe a guy like Jericho Johnson coming in, who's a more highly touted recruit and would probably be able to beat him out for, for playing time. So I, I think that having nine guys from that group of 10, I if you'd asked me, you know, with how the transfer portal has worked at the time, I probably would have said, ah, I bet you seven stick around. But nine out of 10 are here. And I think that's a great sign for, you know, the culture that's being established on that side of the ball and the potential that they all have, because there's clearly nobody amongst that group, you know, Michael Gardner, Johnny Bowens, Terrence Green, Ashton Porter, those guys, Amari Washington, there, there's clearly no one who at this point in time has stood out in a way that leads the other guys to say, I'm not going to be able to beat him. They're all talented recruits, and they all think right now they're going to have an avenue to playing time, but they've got to go out there and earn it. And maybe one or two change their mind after spring football because someone pops or Breland's really good or Johnson's ready to play or Zadavian Sims. But I think that it's a really good sign that those guys have stuck around. And I, I am more than a little intrigued to see how many and, and, and which of those guys end up being key players for the Ducks defense. And there's reason to believe that these guys are going to be able to step up to the plate, step up to the task that is put in front of them. Because keep in mind here, Spencer, a majority of those D linemen that signed in 2023, maybe they didn't play, sure. But they're giant humans. So they had the frame physically to be ready to make an impact. But now all they did in 2024, and I say that with some sarcasm, was learn and develop behind one of the better uh, defensive lines in college football. So now they have this task put in front of them of, you know, hey, we need some guys to to step into these roles. And if last season showed us anything, it's that the more guys you have that are ready to come in and kind of keep you fresh, that's going to be a tremendous asset for Oregon. So I, I think we're definitely on the same page. That was uh, my number three question uh, on Ducks Digest when I wrote five questions for Oregon ahead of spring ball. And I want to stay on defense for this next one, Spencer. There is a lot of talent at this position, but I don't know if I should say 
who steps up in the secondary or what the heck is the secondary going to look like? Because you have some guys coming back, you have some portal guys, you have some recruits that are developing, but it's, it's hard to kind of get a pulse, particularly on the safety room. I think the cornerback room is, is a little bit more clear at this point, but Jalil Florence is, is working back from injury. So Yo, I think I'm the, the whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. We got to flush that out. I'm the inverse. The safety room is easy to project. The cornerback room is a smorgasbord. I, I like you've got so many more names in the in the corner room than the safety room. Like the safeties are low key kind of thin. That, that that's more so what I was getting at. Like you know who's gonna play, right? I mean, oh okay. Ashim Johnson and Co- and Kobe Savage. Uh, Brandon Johnson isn't with the team just yet. He's gonna play some nickel. Um, but like you got to have depth there because you know if you've got an injury to either one of those guys and you have almost no experience to lean on. So th- that's more so where my question is coming from there. I-, I would agree that the cornerback rotation is is a little bit more kind of murky right now. Yeah, I think it's Jabbar Muhammad and then a bunch of question marks. And my instinct is to say Jalil Florence will be the number two corner. I mean, he played as a true freshman. He played more last year. He was one of Oregon's top two corners. I thought he did a good job. But you'd never know how guys are going to come off that injury. And Lanning said in his first presser of spring practice that, you know, with both him and Noah Whittington, they're in kind of a, you know, wait and see. Mo- like, Lanning never gives out anything on injuries. and uh, But th- those injuries really occurred not that long ago. I mean, Florence was injured, was injured you know, in the in the Pac-12 championship game. That's first week of December. I mean, that that's... I he, he didn't play in that game, I don't think. Because he was on crutches at the Oregon State game. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. So, so you know, end of November and whatnot. We're talking like, what, four months here? Yeah, like, not a lot of time. Yeah, exactly. That that's not a lot of time. If you if like if you if it was serious enough for you to miss time and be on crutches, I don't think he can be ready by now. And so we don't know exactly, or at least I don't know, you might, what what the injury actually is or what surgery is required, what the recovery timeline looks like. But with both him and Whittington, I don't expect to see either one in spring football. I'd no, expect Noah's back. Noah was going through some stuff yesterday and we saw Well that that that's that's stuff. good to hear, but I do think Lanning I, I I did remember Lanning saying that he, you know, is still kind of ramping up like he's not at full strength yet. And certainly you expect him to be able to. He was injured very early in the year. But sure. but anytime a guy's coming off an injury, you you have to ask the question, is he going to be the same player? Right? He might still be a good player, but is he the same player? Like if Jalil Florence comes back and he's not quite the athlete he was, well, that's still a good player, but that could open the door for Cam Alexander maybe to take his starting spot. You know, if it just knocks you down a little bit, because I think when you've got this many talented guys, your margins are very thin. And so when you've got those sorts of thin margins, any little thing can make the difference there. And, you know, I want both guys to come back healthy because I think they're the best that Oregon has to offer at their respective position groups as it pertains to where they sit in the depth chart. But if they're not able to play the season healthy or if they're not at 100 percent, I think Oregon's got a lot of talent in both spots, you know, waiting in the wings. And it sounded like some of the chatter or, you know, some of the reports I was reading yesterday were that uh, Jalil Florence didn't practice uh, on Thursday and we didn't really expect him to. But now the question becomes, is he going to be available in the spring game? And if he doesn't play in the spring game, then how confident are you that he's going to be able to be 100% by the time the season kicks off? But to your point about the margin for error being thin, I think that you can look at that uh, duo of Jabbar Muhammad and Cam Alexander, more so maybe Alexander, but like a little bit of insurance for, for that cornerback room because we don't necessarily know what Jaleel Florence is going to look like just yet. If he can mirror what he did last year then you got a great corner and then take a step forward right because you want to see that year-to-year improvement you have potentially an all-conference caliber corner in Jaleel Florence but I think Cam Alexander brings a different element of speed that this cornerback room didn't quite have to the level that it wanted a year ago but then you also have to look at Dante Manning coming back he's played a ton of football for Oregon but kind of similar to to Keon Ware Hudson we, we kind of know w- what he's capable of and, and what his level of performance is in Eugene. But then that's why you bring in, if you're Dan Lanning, Tosh Lapoy, and Chris Hampton, that's why you bring in Sione Laulea. That's why you bring in a duo of All-Americans and Ify Obadegwu and, and Dakota Fields. Fields is already in Eugene. Uh, Obadegwu hasn't arrived just yet. 
Um, but then you also have some other guys on that roster, like Dalen Austin and Roderick Pleasant. Like, there's so many names there. Uh, you just can't help but wonder what the pecking order is going to look like. Yeah, I don't. I don't think any true freshman DBs are seeing the field at the cornerback spot. There's too much talent ahead of them. Just w- there's too much talent how and cool experience. How cool would it be if someone did? If someone did break through? Oh, a, I mean, if a, how cool would that be? If Dakota or Iffy end up being like regular players in Oregon secondary this year, that means they're on track to be first round NFL draft picks. That like that that that's what you are going to have to get through. I mean, Muhammad is a baller. Yeah, he's absolutely definitely starting. Yeah, that that guy is an NFL caliber corner. So if you've got that at one side, and I think the potential for either all conference or an NFL caliber corner at the other to crack the room, that's what you got to be. And as a true freshman, if you were to break in with that, I think that'd be a pretty impressive feat. I think the safety room is, is just the second most fascinating element of Oregon going into the spring. I think a lot of things about the offense are fairly set in, in, in stone here. And I mean, nothing's in stone at this point in time. That's why you've got spring practice and you don't know what injuries will come about. But I think that for, for the safety room, you know, I, I kind of consider the nickel position to be a safety. I know yeah. it's technically yeah. not like Jalil Florence has played nickel before they move guys around, but Brandon Johnson from Duke, comes over probably to be your starting nickel. Tysheem Johnson, Kobe Savage, your safeties on the back end. The opportunity for one of Aaron Flowers, who will be a true freshman, Tyler Turner, or Cody DeCambra, who are a redshirt freshman, is readily available. For them to not just crack the two deep, but play consistent snaps. I mean, you rotate guys out, someone gets dinged up during the game, you want this personnel package and not that one. I think that they're, I, I think some of those guys are going to see the field. I really, really do. And I think that's, you know, an exciting thing for them. And, you know, a youth movement is never a bad thing as long as it's not, you know, at the expense of succeeding in 2024. And I don't think it would be, you know, you bring in a guy like Savage there for a reason, but at some point, you know, if there's an injury in the safety room, either you're going to need a position change or one of those young guys is going to have to grow up very quickly. And that's in the, in the, potential of an injury like in that kind of hypothetical i think that's when you kind of look at all right are we i mean is, is oregon taking the guy and putting him in there because hey you know that's what we got or is it oh he's ready to go like he's ready for this opportunity and he's gonna be able to cover he's gonna be able to not get beat deep and i think two of the other names that we have to talk about maybe just in the safety or nickel spots are nico reed because I don't really think he's going to separate himself as a, a corner, but I think he played some nickel last year, so we could see him there a little bit. He obviously played a lot of uh, corner in the Pac-12 championship, but that wasn't a night to remember for for the secondary necessarily. I know we were both there in, uh, in Vegas. But also Cullen Gill. I don't think that we've talked too much or heard too much uh, about him. He was a guy that signed with Oregon in the 23 class, kind of a do-it-all DB. Maybe wasn't easy for me to pin down as a corner or a safety, but kind of some of the people I've talked to recently, it seems like he's maybe gearing more towards a safety. So the, those spots behind Johnson Savage and Tyshim Johnson are about as, as wide open as you could ask for. If you're, if you're one of these younger guys, that's looking to make a, a name for yourself. Yeah. I, I think that that's, you know, gotta be exciting if you're one of those players because of, as we discussed the opportunity that is going to be there. And I don't think that, you know, I'm guessing of course, but I don't know that the coaches even know which guys are, are, are going to stand out there. And if they do find out or if they are finding out during spring football, I don't know if Lanning is going to tell us. I mean, <laughs> you know, he keeps things very close to the chest and has got short answers. I think a staple, I talked about this on Locked on Ducks today, a staple of Dan Lanning's press conferences are a reporter doing what is standard question asking practice, and that is you know, setting it up a little bit, give the coach an idea of where you are, give the fans, people watching, listening an idea of, you know, what you're trying to accomplish with this question or that one. And it takes like five to eight seconds to lay out. And then Lanning comes at you with a three second answer. And then we're on to the next one. (laughs) Like that is just, that is a, that is a state. That is how these mechanics just, just kind of work. So I, I don't know how much we'll, 
we'll get to find out, you know, before the spring game. And and certainly April 27th is a day that every Oregon fan should have circled because, you know, we'll, we'll get to learn as much as we possibly can on that day. But coaches certainly will have learned a lot of information by that time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I just booked my flights to, to Oregon yesterday, so I will be in attendance at the spring game. Absolutely cannot wait. And I think two other guys – to just quickly mention, we don't have to touch on him very much, but Kingston Lopa was the other safety that Oregon signed in 2024. Really tall, 6'4", 6'5", kind of similar maybe to that mold of Brian Addison. Not many expect him to to contribute early, but hey, you never know. Maybe if he uh, ends up being the contributor, it'll be cool to come back to this video in March and talk about how, hey, I told you guys to keep an eye out, but you never know. Um, one of the other questions that I, I feel like I don't show enough love, let's talk about special teams particularly the kicking game because Oregon moves on from the program's all-time scoring leader in Camden Lewis. But last season wasn't necessarily one to write home about for him. He finished the year 12 of 18. So just about 66.67% on his field goal attempts. And, you know, you hate to say it, but like Oregon lost three games by three points uh, those those Washington games, and I'm, and I'm not saying that they are solely on him. That is not what I'm trying to say by any means. But you could find yourself in a couple games here, Spencer, in 24, where the, a field goal is the difference between a win and a loss. And now they, they move on, and it looks like Atticus Sappington from Oregon State is, is probably the likely starter there. But what do you make of the kicking game? <laughs> well... I'll be I'll be I'll be delicate here. Um, you can't pin an entire game on one guy, one moment, or even one play. But if that one play goes differently, Oregon at least gets overtime up in Seattle. And I don't know if that changes the mentality that Oregon has. You know, if they were to have won that game the second time, they would have played Washington, but. You know, Camden Lewis was actually perfect in the Pac-12 championship game. He at least ended well in a big game. He hit the field goal, made all his PATs, and every kickoff was a touchback. Unfortunately, that wasn't consistent this year. The field goals weren't the only problem. The kickoff's out of bounds. Man, That that's, that's an extra 10 to 15 yards that you're giving the team. Like, that's the way that you should think about it, right? Oh, well, they're going to start at the 35. Well, how do you feel if you kick it off and it's a touchback and a team comes out and first play, it's a 10-yard completion? That's ex that's essentially what you're giving a team when the ball gets kicked out of bounds. I'm pretty sure Lewis led, I, I don't quote me on this, but I believe Camden Lewis led the Pac-12 last year in number of kickoffs that traveled out of bounds. So I hope that that gets cleaned up. But in the field goal game, Alabama's learned this. Every college football team once upon a time ha has learned this. And Oregon has certainly been through the ringer with kickers over the years. And you think of Oregon's, you know, biggest shortcomings, it's come down to a kicker several times. Maldonado two years in a row and Camden Lewis last year. Like it, it just did. Now, Maldonado was, well, actually, I don't think any of those kicks were for the win on the spot, but certainly they all would have, uh, you know, gotten Oregon to an overtime situation or would have given them a much better chance to win the game. No guarantee that they actually do win those games. But yeah, I think you can't sleep on the special teams. Uh, I, you know, hope Sappington can deliver a 13 to 14 sort of clip. You just can't have a guy who comes out and, you know, I'll, I'll give Camden Lewis a pass on one kick last year. And that was the uh, it was like a 48 yarder against Cal and the rain and wind was swirling. Like th there are like two college kickers that can make that. Now, apparently Cal had a guy, he hit like a 44 yarder. I think the conditions had improved when he kicked it, but you know, point stance, I don't expect you to make every single field goal, but you should be over 80%. If you, if you put up 18 field goals in a year and, and Lewis made 12 last year, that number has got to be at, l at least 15, if not 16 or 17. Like, that's what having a good kicker looks and feels like. And Oregon fans, I don't think, are very used to that. I think Aiden Schneider was really good. You know, he, he was very consistent and steady. Morgan Flint was very solid back in the day. But that's definitely something that Oregon can improve upon. But, you know, 
with, with Sappington in there, my, my biggest question about Oregon in special teams next year is actually not Sappington, even though, you know, does it feel like we're cursed at the position and that he could have a regression year? Yeah, because Camden Lewis just did that. Camden Lewis was second team, all Pac-12, you know, preseason, I think. I think he was honorable mention last year. Like, he was good. He he won Oregon the Texas Tech game. We should that that that's something that has to be Give pointed out. Give him his flowers. Out. Give him his flowers for that. Yeah, like that that is he misses that kick and boom, Oregon is going to lose that Texas Tech game and everything goes awry. But Oregon's return game, particularly on kickoffs, is terrible. Where has it been, dude? It has not been that. Like, I I think Gary Bryan is a real solid receiver. I do not want to see him returning kicks. And that's something that I'm going to look for in the spring game. I don't know if they'll, you know, roll that stuff out at full speed. They usually don't. But, I mean, can somebody be a more valuable kick returner to give Oregon? The last time the Ducks had a kick return touchdown was 2021. The Dan Lanning era has not seen a kick return or a punt return or any sort of special teams touchdown. Who even was that? I can't remember. Mikhail Wright. He had two that 21? year. Yeah. Okay. He had two that season. They... Uh, they were against USC and Oregon State. And then, or, is that right? Is that 21? I thought that was earlier. I know, or, oh, that might have been 19? earlier. No, no, so 21 against Oregon State. He had a kick return touchdown, 19 against USC. Okay, okay. That um, makes sense. But he was definitely there in 2021. And he had a kick return touchdown against the Beavs because Oregon won that game like 17 to 10. And one, yeah. of, the and one of the touchdowns was, was his kick return. But also... I did the dive on the numbers. Oregon did not have a single kick return last year over 25 yards. That's crazy. Like that, 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 that means not a single kickoff was returned into opponent's territory, which can be momentum shifting plays and not require as much of your offense. And that means every time a kickoff was returned for the Ducks last year, if it was fielded inside the five, which most kickoffs are that are, that are returned, the ball never reached the 30 yard line. Never. Not a, not a, not a, not a single time did it reach thirty yard line. So I think that's got to get better for the Ducks. But certainly, you cross your fingers that Sappington can continue to be a reliable kicker because you know it's it's like health insurance. You never need it until you really really do, and then everything rests on what you have in the bag. Some final thoughts from me on the special teams, and then I have one more question I want to sneak in there. Spencer, if that's cool with you. Yep. So the the kicking game, you know, it's obviously that I'm really happy that you brought up the return game because Oregon just has way too much talent and way too much speed to not be putting up better numbers. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Get you know, get Roderick Pleasant out there. Get Noah Whittington out there, who obviously we couldn't see last year. But like those are just some of the options that come to mind, right? And I think that you just. Yeah, you have to be more impactful there, and you, you never need it until you need it um, for, for both of those. And I just think that the best overall teams also have special teams units that can be game changers, have a punter that can flip the field or pin them inside the 20 or have a guy that can rip off a big return. So we're, we're definitely on the same page there. My final question here is um, maybe, I don't know, it's a kind of a two-parter. I think... My, it really starts with, is Jordan James going to emerge from spring ball or maybe better yet enter fall camp as the lead back? Because Noah Whittington's back. We all know that. But, you know, how is he going to look post-injury? And I, like just because he was injured, don't expect Jordan James to take it any easier. And then how does how does Jay Harris slide into the, the mix here? You know, I think it's going to be a three-headed monster in that backfield. And he is a guy who I just don't really know what his role is going to look like because he didn't catch a lot of passes at Northwest Missouri State, and we know that Oregon's running backs are a big part of the passing game, at least with Bucky Irving. So that running back rotation is is a little bit of a question mark, not because there's not talent, but I just don't know how it's going to shake out because Jordan James is really freaking good. He is, but so is Noah Whittington, and I think that it's easy to forget that because James was such a stud last year, and there were times, it wasn't always, but the Pac-12 championship game most recently – there were times where James was running better than Bucky Irving. And there were times where Irving was, you know, being his dynamic, explosive tackle breaking self. But, you know, they, they have different running styles. And sometimes it was James and sometimes it was Bucky. And I think that for the Ducks, you know, I, I don't know how, if at all, Jane Lamar or Jay Harris carve out a role for themselves. 
but certainly the possibility is there. I mean, to begin last season, it was a three-man running back rotation. You know, Bucky was kind of one, and then you had, I think, one B and one C of, well, maybe 2A and 2B was the better way to look at it, where it was Irving was the one, and then it was Whittington and, and James were next, and then Whittington goes down, and it's, you know, kind of 1A, 1B of sorts with with Bucky Irving and Jordan James. And if you go back to 2022, Oregon used three running backs all the time that year, right? Byron Cardwell was at the start, throwback name, uh, Byron Car- Cardwell like, where are you was... Going with this? <laughs> yeah, like he was kind of involved at the start, but then he faded down the depth chart pretty quickly. But Sean Dollars was a part of that backfield all year long. And it was, again, Bucky Irving, Noah Whittington. I mean, heck, that was a four-man rotation. You had Sean Dollars in there as a pass catcher, and you had Jordan James as the short yardage back. So clearly, there's a willingness from the coaching staff to employ a multi-back system and not have, you know, a feature guy a la, you know, Derrick Henry of sorts, or, you know, any of those Alabama running backs like that, or like Zach Charbonnet at UCLA um, for, for a couple of years. I, I, I'm most interested to see if they go that direction, if, you know, Lamar, who's a little bit smaller, a little bit more of a scat back, like a Sean Dollars type, if they put him on the field on passing downs, because, you know, Winnington catch passes and James did it a little bit last year as well. But I wouldn't say that it's, you know, a feature of their game. I think it's something they're just capable of. So, yeah, I think the running backs on offense are interesting. And I, I don't think people should sleep on Noah Whittington. Remember, Jordan James was the same guy on the first game as he was in the last game. And that staff had Noah Whittington ahead of him on the depth chart. So if Whittington comes back fully healthy, I could see him being Oregon's number one back. We'll have to see how that one ultimately shakes out. And and to your point, Jordan James only caught 15 passes last year. So compared to compared to Bucky Irving's 56, like we still don't necessarily know how his uh, how his pass how his role will kind of shake out in the passing game. But that's not to say that he's not capable of it. We just need to see more volume. Um, but I fully expect right now for Oregon to have a three back, uh, you know, rotation in, in 2023, 2024. Um, because Lachlan's shown that not only is he committed to it, but he has a good handle of how to kind of disperse those carries. I still don't understand why Jordan James didn't get more carries in that Pac-12 title game, but that's a different conversation for a different day. This is a loaded backfield. I'm excited to see how this all shakes out, and and Jay Harris is kind of the biggest wild card right now at this position. Um, but we can. Probably- I had a. Uh, I I had a viewer submit a question about whether he could be Cyrus Habibi Likio. Just come in inside the 10 yard line or Jordan James in 2022, same sort of deal. But, you know, I don't think that Harris quite has the explosiveness that, that James has, you know, in terms of straight line speed. I, I think that and Harris is bigger and they're actually almost identical in frame. So if they go back to, hey, we want a big back to, you know, be our goal line guy and our short yardage specialist, I could see that being Jay Harris. But we also know that Jordan James is excellent in short yardage spots because that's how he began his career with the Ducks. And that's why it was so exciting to see him make the leap that he made last year, because to go from a short yardage back to, a, you know, one B, like you were saying, alongside Bucky Irving, like that's no easy thing to do. But he showed that he just needed the carries, like just give me the ball and I'm ready to go. So I'm a huge Jordan James fan. Uh, definitely, definitely, uh, you know. I don't, maybe that's, I don't know if that'll be my fan club this year because he's kind of a, you know, more of a common solidified piece. Uh, but I'll have to find someone to be the the president of the fan club. Spencer, before we get you out of here, man, let the people know where can they find more of you and what you have going on in this space because you are just doing a heck of a job. I try the best that I possibly can. I host Locked On Ducks and Locked On College Football Monday through Friday on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. I am on X, formerly known as Twitter, at S. McLaughlin CFB. Got the new handle once the show debuted back in January. So everything is just rolling along. The content season continues and content knows no bounds. And that exists even here in the magical month of March. There you go. There you go. Well, make sure you guys tap in with Spencer. Um, You know, we have a really good thing going. I go on his show. He comes on my show. Um, I want to do like a weekly thing, but I don't know if that's too much. Hopefully we'll get there at some point. But Uh, my 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 schedule is opening up now uh, in spring season because Southern Utah doesn't have baseball. We just have softball. So, 
you know, anytime softball's out of town, I'm not traveling to do radio with them. I am just kind of at home hanging. So my schedule's a lot more available now. Because for, for those, I don't know how many people care about this, but Max and I have been trying to link up to do a show for a while, but I've been exceedingly busy. I was down in Vegas with the SU women's basketball team for, for the last couple of days. And, you know, the end of the season had a lot of games and everything like that. So it's been busy, but it's golf season now, baby. It is. And you, if I know one thing, Spencer, you're going to be out there uh, getting your swings in. And I was uh, I was on the golf course yesterday. There you go. If it wasn't raining, I'd be on it today. Right on, right on. Well, yeah, make sure you guys tap in with Spencer and, you know, give him a follow and, and subscribe to all his stuff. Um, you know, I'll just listen to it sometimes when I'm just hanging out. So um, definitely got a fan in me and hopefully we'll be able to set something up more regularly because I'm sure the people would eat it up. But if you guys want to find more of me, you can follow me on Twitter, formerly X, X, formerly Twitter. I don't know what. See, I don't want to call it X because I haven't been doing that. Find X, formerly on- known as Twitter, <laughs> is what I've been rolling with. I like the way it rolls off the tongue. Because I usually say, and I'm going to keep it going here as I butcher this outro, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at mtorissports. Subscribe to my YouTube channel at Oregon Football Max Taurus. Read me over on ducksdigest.com and share the show with your friends, with your family, and with other Duck fans. But a huge thank you to Spencer. Thank you to you guys for taking some time to tune in. And we will see you on the next episode of the Duck's Dish Podcast.